The Joker has done some terrible things within his lifetime, but what if someone was finally sent in to kill the Joker? And what if that someone was James Gordon? This is the full story of the Joker storyline spanning issues 1 through 15 from the 2021 release by James Tynan. A day has just happened. Most of the criminals within Arkham Asylum are either missing or dead at this point. Joker just conducted the Joker War, taking over Gotham, and then he ran off to try and hide. But the events of A-Day are being blamed on him. And of course, that's going to piss off a few other individuals, a few individuals who want the Joker dead. But before we get into that story, you have found yourself a comic story where I take a lot of comic books, I break them down into audio dramas, read them back dramatically to you because it's just fun to do, but it also allows you to know where you should be going in the comic book store. What comics do you truly enjoy? What do you need to add to your collection? And what artwork is truly incredible? This is the Full Story channel. We're grabbing issues 1 through 8 that we covered on the channel, but then we're also going to be covering 9 through 15 for the first time right here. All 15 issues in the 2021 Joker storyline. Let's get into it. A long time ago in Chicago, a young Jim Gordon sits in a bar for his going away party. Though it felt more like a good riddance one since he didn't have the greatest reputation on the force. He'd gotten five boys in blue demoted for taking bribes. So his reward was a promotion and a transfer to hell. Let Gotham deal with Jim, they said. Maybe those boys will set him straight. But that wasn't the strangest part of the whole ordeal. It actually came from another office, Danny Ryan. Danny was a heavy set cop, always wheezing when he spoke. And he asked Jim if he'd ever seen his boogeyman yet. Jim brushed it off, telling him that he'd seen some rough things already, here and in the war. Except that wasn't what Danny was referring to. He went on to state that there comes a time in every cop's life where they come face to face with a horror that they can't get rid of. An evil that every time they close their eyes, they see it as vividly as the day that they came across it. For him, he saw the devil eating the face of a 17-year-old girl. When he saw him, he held up a piece of meat and he asked if he wanted to share. But after drawing his gun, the man threw a knife into his leg and escaped, laughing down the alleyway. Never caught him, though. Spent every damned night trying to find that psycho, and now every time he closes his eyes, he sees that man there, holding out a piece of meat. There's the law, and then there's evil, and when you see evil, you aim for the head. Jim took his leave after that, trying to process just what in the hell he was told. It took a few years for what Danny said to make sense, because these days he sees the damned devil every time he closes his eyes. Eventually, a day came, or at least that's what people are calling it. Nearly 500 patients, healthcare workers, and security guards killed in the deadliest gas attack in the history of the United States. It was the death of Arkham Asylum. Reports state that the gas bomb went off at midnight and most of the deaths happened in the first five minutes before any alarm went off. It was an altered version of the classic Joker toxin formula. Victims smiled, but they didn't laugh, so no one could hear it spreading from room to room. They say Batman beat the police to the scene and helped disperse the toxin from the air. But Mayor Nakano directed his men to arrest Batman in lieu of there being anyone else to arrest. Unsuccessfully, mind you. Jeremiah Arkham, Jonathan Crane, Bane, countless others all dead. Reports showed that there was footage of the Joker leaving the asylum during his attack on the city last fall. The running theory now is that the Joker planted these gad bombs before he left Gotham, setting them to go off months later. He was supposed to be retired, not chasing after some madman once again. But lately, he looks out to see the evil men with his eyes open, and then the laughter when he closes them. Everywhere he looks, all he can see is the Joker's face. What he did to Barbara nearly broke Jim, but she lived and learned to thrive. It's knowing that he played a hand in tipping his son over the line one last time that James had a hard path. He struggled with a deep and powerful evil inside of him. He struggled so that he could stay a part of the Gordon family. But in the end, the Joker knew that he could use James, Jim Gordon's son, as a weapon against him. And so he did. Jim lost his boy, and when he closes his eyes, the devil is laughing at him. However, after seeing James's grave, Jim was approached by a woman and a rather large man. She said that she would like to speak with him regarding the Joker. Taking note of the large man, Jim opens the door stating, yeah, that sounds about right. 
Later, the woman would bring Jim to a fancy estate, telling him that her name was Cressida. She explains that her sources have recently given her photographs that the Joker was in Belize weeks after his attack on Gotham. Jim asked why would she be showing him all of this and not the police, and Cressida said that the people that she represents thinks that the Joker has reigned terror on Gotham far too long. Rather than wait for his next attack, they'd like to see him taken off the board. They thought that Jim would be the perfect man to hunt him down. He has the most experience with hunting the Joker more than anyone else. He's been tortured in body and soul by this man. The Joker has nearly killed one of his children and instigated the death of another. They can't imagine how much Jim must hate the Joker. Should he accept this? He would be given a bank card with no spending limit for the duration of this mission. Upon completion, they'll deposit $25 million into his personal bank account. Jim asks, You want to pay me that much money just to capture the man and bring him home? Cressida says that he misunderstands. If they wanted to put a bounty on the Joker, they'd just coordinate with the authorities. They want him to kill the Joker. Jim asks, Why would they think that he would agree to this? And Cressida answers him by asking a question. Do you believe in evil, Jim? To which he answers, Yes. Yes, he does. Cressida then says that she understands that this request may be a lot to process, so he has until the end of the week to decide whether to go or not. Just know that he is out there and know that he is planning something. A Day wasn't the end of the Joker's story, it was only the beginning. In Belize, at that exact moment, Joker reads the Gotham Gazette headline, Joker's Last Laugh. Arkham Asylum destroyed and he bursts out laughing. Oh, this is about to get very interesting, isn't it? Jim Gordon was presented with a deal. Kill the Joker. Have unlimited funds, get a massive paycheck at the ending, but kill the Joker. With all the cards on the table, Jim begins to think back to when things were different. He can remember sitting at the dining room table after their move in the small Gotham apartment trying to turn it all out. How much would it be to send a young Barbara to college? How much would it be for the second child that they knew was on the way? Maybe he could stay in the job enough to rack up a title like captain or something respectable. He would try and keep calm through it all, make sure his voice stayed reassuring, tell his wife that he could support her, their daughter and son through the thick and the thin. But sometimes at the kitchen table, he had been weak. He had been thinking about the card that he had up his sleeve if it became necessary. His new partner at the time, Flass, made it clear that he knew of a way to earn a little extra money, and all it took was bending the law. Normally, he would never consider it, but in that moment, he had been staring at a lifetime of bills and debt. Was it really wrong to bend his ethics just a little? Even if it meant supporting his family? If he had been picked up for a few jobs like that, he'd have been able to afford a nice place outside of the city in time for Babs to go to school. But as he sat outside on the fire escape, feeling the cool night air, he knew he couldn't do it. He wasn't that man, not for all the money in the world. And now, as Jim sits on the fire escape once again, he looks at Batman, telling him that it took him long enough. Batman looks at the makeshift bat signal, telling him, It's not your most effective signal. Jim tells him, Well, he's been here for an hour, freezing off his rump. Come inside, they need to talk about the Joker. So Jim laid it all out. Told him about the woman in the limousine, her strange silent chauffeur, the pictures of the Joker in Belize, the money, all of it. But what he doesn't tell Batman is that they want him to kill the Joker, or that he's considering going through with it. Sure, Batman could probably talk him out of it, but when he tries to think of his son's voice, all he can do is hear the Joker laughing. Jim tells himself that he doesn't need to make a decision until he needs to, and he can keep that card up his sleeve, and Batman tells him that if they want to do this, he'd go himself. But the massacre in Arkham Asylum ripped up all the wounds of the Joker War. They've all been torn open. The city is more raw and dangerous than it's been in years, Jim. I'd pursue the Joker myself, but leaving Gotham, it's not an option. And knowing someone I trust is on the mission will help me sleep at night. But you didn't bring me here for my approval. Jim pours himself a cup of coffee. No, I brought you here because I could use some help. First off, I don't like not knowing who is hiring me. I'm going to need to find out more about anyone with the daughter named Cressida. Second, there's plenty of information that I could get from a few phone calls, but those phone calls will bring a lot of attention. Now, I'd rather not have that attention, so I'll need my own intelligence. Batman asks if he wants access to the Bat computer, and Jim says that they can put the parental controls on if they want, but yes. I need access to all of Joker's contacts, former gang members at large, international villains that he's ever aligned himself with, everything from the day that Joker set foot in Gotham. Batman scratches his chin. We might be able to work something out, but we'll need to figure out the best way. Jim stops him. I'm not done. I need to be able to reach you. 
Batman stops. You want my phone number? And Jim tells him, damn right. Batman says that he can give him everything, but there is something needed in exchange. When they do find the Joker, call. Don't go in alone. He will come and make sure that the Joker's apprehended safely and brought back to Gotham. Jim says that that makes sense to him, and Batman says that there is more. He'll have a chaperone. Oracle, are you listening? Oracle says yes. She'd just like to put it on record that this is a stupid idea, and Commissioner Gordon is going to get himself killed. She would also like to point out that he didn't promise that they could bring the Joker back. He said it made sense. Batman turns back to Jim, and Jim can already feel the weight of their eyes. He also realizes that now it's time to come clean, that he has been hired to kill the Joker, or come clean with a card that he's kept up his sleeve for years. He sips his coffee. Are you sure you're not just worrying about your old man, Barbara? Everyone falls silent. Jim Gordon just confirmed that he knows that Batgirl slash Oracle is Barbara Gordon. And Jim gives a little smile. He can hear the gears turning in Batman's mind, trying to guess how long he's known. In another minute, they'll be asking what else he knows. It's good. They're distracted. But there's no distracting Barbara. She tells Jim to meet her at the clock tower now and disconnects. But while Jim leaves to meet with his daughter, he thinks back to a, another encounter that he had back in the day. One night after going through the public functions, he met someone. An ex-CIA agent working in an advisor role to some senator who had been dragged along to some cultural event. After a couple of whiskeys, he'd lean in and asked if they'd ever wondered where all of the costumed baddies went when they slipped off the radar. Jim said of course he'd like to know, and the ex-CIA agent told him it's called The Network a series of luxury getaway spots hidden around the world. It's not just the public set, the private players as well. The killers who spent the last century out of sight of anyone in costume. They retreated, priding themselves on their secrecy, and to prove their worth, they would occasionally host some of the most renowned villains in the world free of charge. The idea was that you could host the Joker for a few months while he's laying low. Then you can sell your client that not even Batman could find you there. The ex-CIA guy says that there was a rumor in the intelligence community that the Joker had been in about 15 of these retreats all around the world. He then leaned in closer asking, Do you know who's funding it all? Look all around. The call is coming from inside of the house. As a businessman with a burned face and armed security stands by the pool, Joker sips his drink. Oh, poo, Desmond. You're not here to spoil my fun, are you? Desmond says that he's afraid so. While they permit killing on their property, killing one of the wealthiest neighbors is not allowed. These are not people who can easily disappear. He is terribly sorry, but they're going to have to ask him to leave the country immediately. And Joker thinks for a moment. Hmm, no, I don't think so. The security points their guns and Desmond says, ask was a polite word. There are two options here. You get in the car and you're taken to a plane and you leave, or you will be killed and fed to the dogs. Joker goes out into the pool, laughing. <laughs> I love your imagination. Very scary. But I'm going to go with the third option. You seen the news, yes? If so, then you would know that there are some people on their way. Desmond asks who, and Joker says, Oh, we're going to keep that a secret for now. Can't spoil the big reveal. But, needless to say, the attack on Arkham had rubbed a few people the wrong way. We both don't want a war coming here. So I just happened to move the target 13 miles southwest, created a trail for my enemies to follow. We have the high ground here, so when anyone comes down the road, we'll kill them! Oh, and if you don't mind, send a maid to clean up. The corpses are starting to stink a bit. And send a tailor. Make sure that they have plenty of purple and green fabric. I'm very particular. Back in Gotham, Jim knocks on the door to the clock tower, and as Barbara opens it, he says that he brought her some hot chocolate from the diner on Avenue X. Barbara steps out, stating that they haven't been there since she was a teenager, and she's taking it. How much does he know? Jim says that they don't have to unpack all of that just yet. He knows his daughter. Doesn't matter what costume she's wearing or how digitally altered her voice is. Jim says that he knows that she was Batgirl, or was, and now she is the Oracle. As they sit on the bench, Barbara directly says that he said that he would hold Batgirl accountable for what happened to James. Jim sighs, stating that that wasn't fair of him to say. He was angry at himself for more than anything. Angry that he hadn't done more, and that he wasn't more open to his son getting better. He was lashing out because if he hadn't pushed James away, the Joker would have been able to play him. Barbara says that he isn't responsible for what happened to James. But Jim looks at his glasses and says that she can say that, but he can hear the Joker laughing at him every night, even now. That clown has taken so much from them, so damn much, 
Barbara asks, why would he give the Joker an opportunity to take more than with what little they have left as a family? He doesn't even know who's hiring, and for God's sake, is it really about the money she can help him? Hell, he could write a book about his relationship with Batman and he'd be set for life. Jim says that that woman, Cressida, she didn't ask him to turn in the Joker. She asked him to kill the Joker. Barbara pauses. You didn't tell Batman that. And Jim tells her, no, and I'd prefer you not either. Barbara stops. You're considering it. And Jim tells her that he is not, not considering it. She says that years ago, the Joker shot and paralyzed her and then tried to torture him into insanity. And even after all of that, he told Batman to bring him in by the book. Jim stops her. Look, I don't relish the thought. I don't have that kind of cruelty in me, but I can't imagine losing you. You're still a target and he'll have you in his sights as long as he is walking this earth. I'd be damned to hell a thousand times to make sure that the Joker never got to you. Barbara tells him that she won't help him kill the Joker, and Jim says he'll make her a deal. He will only go through with it if he can convince her that it's the right thing. If not, he'll do it Batman's way. But while Jim is making his case to his daughter, there are other players making their move. In Texas, a group of cannibals gather while a vengeful brother swears that they'll cook and eat the Joker for killing their brother in the Arkham attack. And Santa Prisca, a woman that has been injected with venom, has taken out her test tube with only one enemy in mind, the Joker. And Cressida tells the council that she believes that Mr. Gordon will be on a flight tomorrow morning, and the council tells her that she has done good work. Her family name it may finally be cleared off of their ledgers. In the meantime, she may retake her family's seat on the council as they look to solve the city's clown problem once and for all. Cressida reaches town, picking up a mask, putting it on, stating that it's time to finally teach the Joker to beware of the Court of the Owls. Jim can remember it like it was yesterday, that night at the amusement mile. He felt the collar digging into his neck, the cold night air on his naked body, the smell of sweat coming off the circus sideshow act drugged up into a frenzy, dragging him towards his throne. He remembers the panic rising as he grappled with what was happening around him, and he asked Delirious what he was doing there, and the voice of the devil responded, Doing? The Joker asked. You're doing what any sane man in your appalling circumstances would do. You're going mad. For a few moments, Jim believed him. It was hard not to. That's the trick to the Joker. It always feels as if he knows what you're thinking and that he can say the words before they come to your mind. And when you start to break, that's when the laughter takes hold of him. The sound of it destroying the very self-satisfaction and cruelty of it all. After going over these memories, the next morning came and Jim headed to the airport where he met with Cressida. She tells him that she is glad that he could make it. Jim says that he wishes that he could say the same to her. This is all a bit unnerving, if he's being entirely honest. Cressida smiles and says that she has the utmost confidence in him and his abilities. They have gathered intel on the ground in Belize, and there are a number of off-the-book resorts in that region, and they suggest he should begin there. Her man will fly him to the landing strip where the Joker landed, and from there he'll fly commercially. Also, here's your bank card with an unlimited amount of money as promised. You can withdraw any of it, charge anything. Jim takes the black credit card and asks, what if I took out 25 million and treated myself to a nice vacation? Cressida smiles. I don't know. What would you do? But you're a good man. We trust that you'll do the job that you're being hired to do. Though, you can treat yourself a little. So get comfortable. Get new clothes. Whatever makes you comfortable, Mr. Gordon. The flight will be about five hours and then the hunt can begin. A bon voyage and happy hunting. As Jim gets onto the plane, he begins to prepare himself more mentally than anything. Barbara gets to work on finding out more information on Cressida with the help of Orphan trailing close behind. However, it isn't only Jim who is on the hunt for the Joker. Other organizations are making their way to Belize around the same time, some a bit noisier in their approach, while others quietly sail the seas. As Jim lands, he tries to put all of the pieces that he has in place, thinking of what it is exactly that he's dealing with. Joker is in one of these resorts. He has an audience that has invited him in. It's just a matter of finding out who those missing people are. So Jim does what he did on the streets, talk to anyone and everyone. It doesn't take too long to find out that there are several places here that people just, well, don't talk about. After giving them a few drinks, they became a little more comfortable with Jim. There were rumors about one place in particular up in the mountains near the Guatemalan border, a private resort that they don't dare name. So much of the job is just people. Most of the time, if you know what you're doing, you can get all the information you need without anyone realizing what you're after. 
Like, for instance, you might hear about a missing businessman with a house up in the mountains near where this resort nobody will talk about is supposedly at, and how the local authorities just keep quiet when they're asked about it. There's a million possible answers as to why this might be the case, but sometimes you just have to follow those gut feelings and see where they take you. So Jim will follow a few more dead ends, and then he'll find a place where the Joker was a month ago and start piecing together where they're going next. And as Jim pulls up to one of the resorts, he knocks on the door with a voice asking, Quines? Jim says that he's sorry, but his Spanish isn't strong. He was hoping to ask a few questions. He's looking for an old friend of his. Just then the door flies open, and the man he's hunting for, the man he doesn't want to see, answers, Jimbo! Is that really you? Jim freezes, and once he gets his bearings, he grabs his gun and he points it at the Joker, just as several armed men point their guns at him. Joker tells everyone, put your guns away! This is an old pal of mine from Gotham City! Oh, the fun we used to have! As the smile begins to stretch across the Joker's face, he leans his forehead into the barrel of Jim's gun. This is one of those crapper get off the pot moments, Jim. <laughs> After a few moments of contemplating, Jim pulls back, holding his hands up, and the Joker laughs. See? We're all friends here! Oh, Jimmy boy, you showed up just in time! This sort of thing is all too grisly without an audience you know and love! Jim asks, what the hell are you talking about? And Joker throws his arm around him. See? I'm not too sure if you're aware of this, but a few weeks ago, somebody gassed Arkham Asylum and blew half the place up! Jim says that they all know that the Joker did it, and Joker's face quickly turns to one of disgust. That's the darndest thing, Jim! Jimmy boy! I didn't do it! Someone just wanted you to think I did, and now everyone is coming here to try and kill me! But they're just in time for the fun! These people took out their men in the trees and are coming up the hill now. Keep that gun drawn, Jimbo! You're gonna need it, cause I need you to protect me! <laughs> in your adult life, you don't really stop to think about why you do the things that you do. You lie to yourself and you say that you're going out of principle, not out of habit. You tell yourself that you'd keep doing it just the same if you pause long enough to consider. You get very good at lying to yourself the older that you get. And Jim has always been a better liar than he wanted to be. It's easy to put himself in the shoes of a hypothetical good man, the man that he wished to be, and to say the things that the man would say. But it was easy because he thought that he was that good man, trying to do some good in a bad world. It was okay for him to lie to his wife to pretend that he would be there for her, because he knew that he was saving lives, that he could bring his righteous zeal to the justice system. But that all changed the night that the Joker shot his daughter and tried to drive him insane. He did look at himself in the mirror, and he did not see a good man looking back anymore. He just saw a tired, broken, old fool who had pushed everyone who loved him away in a pursuit of something intangible, unachievable, something mad. But all of that goes away as a large woman wearing a Bane mask storms out of the Joker's hideout and Jim watches as she jumps down to take the Joker down. But in that brief moment, Jim had to make a decision. Would the mercenaries care? Would Barbara ever find out that it was him who did it? He could claim the 25 million bounty on the Joker's head and be rid of that devil from the world. Just maybe, maybe. He would stop hearing the Joker's laughter when he closed his eyes. All he needed to do was pull the trigger. But he can't. It all feels wrong. He doesn't know the woman in the mask. He doesn't know who these armed guards are. He is seeing a whole world of evil that has never been more visible to him. And he knows that he can't just fall into it. He can't just join this group and kill the Joker. He should call Barbara. That way he can get to the bottom of all of this. But as Jim quickly begins to get up from his cover, one of the guards stops him, telling him that Mr. Desmond would like a word with him. Joker yells, <laughs> Hey, look at that she-bane! It's not a party without a party bus! Two sophisticated people step out, and the man tells Vicky that it looks like they're just in time. Vicky takes out her knives, stating, Good thing that we put the pedal to the metal, buddy. Buddy stabs one of the guards on his way out, telling her, You're right. Look at all these fresh throats to slit. But as they get closer, Vicky says that the clown belongs to the Samson family. He's coming back to Texas to meet Pa. Buddy licks the blood from his knife. Oh boy, is Pa plenty hungry for some fresh clown meat? 
The woman in the Bane mask tells them that the clown is coming back with her for the death of Bane. He is coming to Santa Prisca for an execution. But Joker struggles. All right, all right, all right. Well, I have a very important question. What's black and white and red all over? It's the nerve gas canisters that I spent the last few days planting around the grounds. I painted them that way. You know, for the joke. <laughs> As he presses a small button, the gas is released, engulfing everyone in a colorful haze, knocking them all out. Jim could hear the shoes hitting the floor as the Joker walked up to him. And as he looked up at the three faces of evil, Joker tells him, Shh, go on, Jimmy boy. It's time for the sleep. Later that night, Joker takes out a pair of pliers and begins to sew Buddy's mouth shut with wires that he had sitting in a fire. When he looks over and smiles at Jim away. We really need to talk. But don't worry, it's only the two of us. Joker starts wrapping the hot wire around Buddy's head. Well, there's him too, but it looks like he can't hear a thing. He's not even struggling anymore, Jimmy boy. Poor Buddy Samson. He really thought that he was something scary, like his Uncle Billy. Now there was a man who knew how to put fear of God into you. Shall look him up sometime. Joker then grips the wire and pulls it, digging into Buddy's skin. Don't worry. I'm just helping him. Gotta throw a bone to the younger generation, you know? Can't always rely on their good looks. Joker holds the pliers to the fire, asking Jim, Why is it that you believe that despite all the things that I've done and all the people that I've murdered, that I will accept help from the shadows? Batman would have gone crazy if not for me. I ground Batman. Batman is a hypocrite, but he doesn't know it. He believes it. But Jim Gordon, you're a hypocrite. And you know it. You don't look at the world like Batsy. You don't look at it like a dumb kid. You're a grown man and you see that the world is broken. You saw Batman as a way to get at the people that you couldn't get otherwise. Because the world is broken. But that doesn't change anything. Not really. So, is there any part of you that believes that Batman would finish this job? Joker rips the tape off of Jim's mouth, shouting at him, Answer! Give me an answer, Jim! Jim coughs. <coughs> it's not a war that can be won. Joker leans in. Come on! Deep down, there's a little spark, right? There's a part of you that thinks that there is such a thing as good and evil. But you also know that fighting evil doesn't make you good. But you can't stop trying to be good. You just fight evil. Why? Jim stares for a moment. I don't know how to be good, but I do know how to fight evil. Joker laughs. <laughs> That's why I knew I could count on you. Now, on to the next order of business. Since you're now a private detective, there's a case that needs to be solved. Who pulled the attack on Arkham Asylum? Why does everyone think it's me? Jim tells him, you did it. And Joker bursts out again. Really? When have I ever pulled a job like that and not left a message? Anything that would have given me credit. Why would I use gas more likely to kill people in their sleep than hear the laughter growing from cell to cell? Don't you think that I have a hundred more interesting ways to kill Arkham Asylum? There are plans. Plans for Bane, Gotham, Batman. Everyone was going to hate them. These were all things being cooked up before my war. But some people got wind of it and it scared the crap out of them, Jimmy boy. Scared them enough that they were willing to kill almost 500 people just to send the right people my way to kill me. Those people are being used like you. See, there are these rules in the world. Not laws, but rules. People who care about the rules don't care about the laws. The superheroes, they fit into the rules. And so do most people like me, who put on silly costumes and try to kill the superheroes. We're allowed to keep playing our games as long as we don't break the rules. But me? I don't like the rules very much. Never really been a color inside the lines kind of kid. Jim asks, why try to convince me that you didn't do something that everyone knows you did? Joker tells him, because this is worse. I'm going to show you how little everything that you have ever done in your life matters and how little your notions of good and evil factor into this. And it's going to break you. So much more than stripping you naked in a broken amusement park. Anyways, there's so much more that needs to be done first before going back to Gotham. Maybe it's time to stop by somewhere in Europe. Glad to have this little chat and clear the air. Say hello to Barbara for me. <laughs> 
As Joker leaves Jim to himself in the middle of the woods, Jim tries to break free of his restraints, but he falls over. Then the restraints are ripped apart and the woman with the Bane mask stares at him. Jim tells her that he's gone, and as she looks around, she looks back at him, telling him, James Gordon of Gotham. Jim says yes. The woman says, you need to go home. You're already drowning in darkness. Head back to the light while you still can. As Jim gets up, putting on his glasses, the woman turns and leaves without saying another word. And that right there was Joker 1 through 4. And I know it's a heck of a cliffhanger, but this is a long, ongoing story. And we're about to take a break from it to go to an older story. To tell one of the first times that Jim met up with the Joker and when he learned that the Joker is more than he seems. So we'll be back to the main story eventually, but let's go to Joker issue 5 and learn what Jim learned that day. Long ago, an old partner of Jim's back in Chicago told him that there would be two kinds of people. Those who end up in the right place at the right time and those who end up in the wrong place at the wrong time. He never put much thought to it back then until he transferred to Gotham, but now he's a believer. He's worried that Gotham is just a city full of wrong places. And back when he was just a captain, he could have waited for backup or he could have done something. A team already went in and didn't return, so should he have waited for backup? Sure, but he didn't. He had good men inside and God knows what could have happened to them. His quick thinking led him to stopping a thug from killing a pair of blues, but that wasn't what was on his mind. The Joker was still swimming through his head, and when Dent told him that the judge agreed to Joker's insanity defense and to not going to trial, well, that didn't sit well. The Joker was going to be sent to Arkham, the loony bin. The Joker was just going to walk out the front door. So the next day, Jim and his wife Barbara went to their marriage counselor. But Jim was too distracted. How could they let the Joker go like that? He has to see for himself what this place is like. So he left Barbara at that meeting so that he could find out what kind of place Arkham was. One of the nurses there, Frank, explains that they have an all-secure and state-of-the-art facility. However, in this one particular wing, there is only one resident, Billy Sampson. He killed an eight. The facility's director, Jeremiah Arkham, stopped Frank, stating that there is no need to go into detail with their guest. And Jim says that he is quite set up here. And Jeremiah says, isn't it just lovely? The building has been at his family for generations, and it sits on 22 acres and... But Jim interrupts him, telling him, I was less concerned with the grass and more concerned with your security. There's a man in here calling himself the Joker. He should be the one in this wing, not some drugged up Billy Sampson. Jeremiah tells him that he would consider that when this facility was constructed, they were heavily funded by a generous donation by Billy's brother, Sawyer Sampson. And that was all on the condition that Billy's home be here until such time that he is cured or deceased. They can't move him without his brother's consent. Jim says that that is fine. He'll ask Sawyer himself. And so that day, Jim did. He had a conversation with Sawyer and explained why they need to have the Joker in that room and they need to move Billy out. Sawyer told him that he paid a fortune to build that area of Arkham just for his brother. All the luxury and security that the boy deserves. He doesn't know why them having some Joker that they can't handle would make him love his brother any less. But Jim couldn't let it go. So he waited until he was relieved and he could go home. All was quiet when a call came in, but the signal was so weak, Jim couldn't understand it. It sounded like he wasn't going to get a replacement. Something about not babysitting the Joker and to drop it. However, before anything could be settled, the patients began to run out of the building in a panic, and Jim ran in asking, where is he? Frank tells him that he doesn't know what's going on. The patients have never acted like this before, and Jim shakes him, demanding to know where. Frank points in the direction of the cafeteria, yelling, there. As Jim hurries in, the Joker looks up from his pie. This is such a lovely surprise. Didn't know that you were mentally unwell. Jim grabs him, telling him that he's going back to his cell, and the Joker asks, can I finish my pie? I'm so quite hungry. Jim tells him no, and the Joker says, it's almost like you miss me. Like you couldn't stop thinking about me, Jim. Jim scowls, pushing the Joker, telling him to get moving, and the Joker asks, Oh, did I touch a nerve? As the door to the cell is slammed shut, Jim can hear the laughter, and the Joker looks out from the food slot, telling him, I'm really in your head, aren't I? Do you want to know 
Why? Jim walks up to the storage, pulling out a chair and sits in front of the cell. And the Joker asks, are you there? Do you want to know why? Jim tells him to be quiet, but the Joker continues. You've dedicated your life to stopping crime. You see how it works. Good, normal people pushed and pulled, twisted and broken by a cruel system. Folks like you, but desperate. You ask yourself, what would I do if my children were going hungry? Would I steal, rob, push dope? Would I kill? You wouldn't kill because you're a good man after all. But you understand it. You can see a piece of yourself in those people and you want to use it to fight back. And when you look at me, you don't see that piece. You don't see anything that looks like you. At first you took comfort in that, but not anymore. You saw me and you thought, he's a freak, he's an anomaly. But you'll come back for another look because you're not sure anymore. Something is coming out of this city, something bad. Because if you're watching people like me, then who's watching people like Falcone or Jim Jams? Jim jumps up remembering a stakeout that they had and he tells one of the janitors to watch the Joker as he runs to his patrol car. He yells over the radio that if anyone can hear him, but he hears static and he says that he's held up at Arkham. Hopefully the big meeting wasn't tonight. And when Jim comes back in, he sees the janitor has left to go to the bathroom. So Jim hurries to the cafeteria with his gun drawn and the Joker finishes getting himself another slice of pie. Do you want any? Jim returned the Joker back to his cell and sat there with his gun out, lighting cigarette after cigarette until the morning came. But it paid off. Jeremiah said that Sawyer would fund another wing of the hospital for more security. And it seems like his chat did wonders. They're even moving the Joker into the room that Billy is currently in and Billy will be moved. The only request is for him to leave. So Jim goes back to the city. He hears a call requesting an additional unit. There was a shooting, and as he arrives, he learned that the meaning was last night. That while he was watching the Joker, his team went in and they were ambushed. Dent runs out asking him, where the hell were you, Jim? Jim tells him, I, I didn't hear the radio. I was up at Arkham and the Joker, he's done. We got him, Jim. Falcone's men were waiting for us and we walked right in and you were supposed to be there. Those officers were shot because of you. They were slaughtered because you couldn't let the Joker thing go. You weren't where we needed you, Jim. Jim goes back telling Harvey that he was a good man, that he can't blame him for what he said, but he's wrong and the Joker is right. He didn't understand it yet, but something awful is growing in Gotham. And if they want to stand any chance against it, he is exactly where he was needed last night. With leads on where the Joker went slowly drying up, Jim Gordon finds himself in Paris, the city of love. He watches a mind perform thinking that he and his first wife would go on dates here. Not the real one, but a fancy downtown spot in Chicago. The night he proposed, he promised a honeymoon to the real Paris, and they started to imagine the trip together. But as the day grew closer, a rash of homicides broke out in Chicago's Gold Coast, all pointing to a wealthy teen. Problem was, Gordon didn't have the evidence to put that kid away, and all the other officers were drooling at the chance of closing the case with him out of town. So instead of going on that trip, Gordon canceled the trip to Paris. He broke his wife's heart, but the situation got worse. He didn't cancel, so they were charged anyway. He couldn't reschedule. And then she became pregnant with young Barbara, and they stopped talking about Paris. Now it's been a week since the Joker left him tied to a chair in Belize after claiming that he was innocent of the murders at A-Day. Barbara tracked him to France, but that's when things got cold. He couldn't figure out where to go, so his daughter convinced him to use that unlimited black credit card and get something a little bit more comfortable. Get one of the nicest rooms in the city. So after a meal and a shower, he calls her up to go over the next move, seeing as this was a dead end. She goes on explaining that she found out some information about something weird happening at Santa Prisca. She has no intelligence about them having the ability to create a new Bane. So Jim brings up other options, other locations, other trails that Barbara could have checked. 
but she can't find any information on it. She realizes that there's something big going on, something that is invisible to the entire Bat family in Gotham. As for this Cressida, the one who hired Jim, well, she's living the most boring version of a lavish life ever imagined. She goes on asking him if he has access to the private jet or anything in general. Jim says that he could use it, that he would need to find a destination. So Barbara asks him if he remembers a picture that she drew for him, the one that was on the fridge. Obviously, Jim is confused. He had many pictures on the fridge, but she tells him the one with the big pair of eyes. After they hang up, Jim realizes that she was using a code phrase. She was informing him that she thinks that someone is watching him, which is funny because he was having the same feeling since arriving to France. After getting dressed, he heads to a payphone. It's there that he calls Harvey Bullock back in Gotham. His old second in command, his right hand man. He informs Harvey that he's going to need some information and that he has an unlimited budget to pay Harvey. There's a trail in Gotham and he needs someone off of the books to handle it. Harvey argues with him about the price, goes back and forth that he's a little bit busy, but in the end, Harvey always trusts Jim, and Harvey agrees to work with him and figure this out. But as he's closing out this conversation, Jim looks over his shoulder to see a group of police officers surrounding him. They draw their guns and they tell him to step away from the phone in French, and Jim says, I don't speak any French. American! American! At that moment, an older woman with black hair and a white streak running through it lights a cigarette, stating that she'd wager that they all speak better English than him. Jim asks her if she minds telling him why they sent the French Foreign Legion down after him, and the woman exhales and tells him that it's probably the fact that his fingerprints are all over a murder scene. Jim pauses. How many bodies? Four. At a private laboratory in Montmartre. Jim sighs. The damn clown! And the woman says, yes, the clown. I thought that might be the case. But these officers, they are, how do you say, very literal men. So how about you come with me? Jim begins to walk to the car parked besides them, stating that it sounds about right. And the woman tells him not to worry, relax. Interpol will take very good care of him. And up watching all of this is the Joker, smiling that twisted Joker grin. Meanwhile, over in Santa Prisca, a man shows Panadoro to a woman telling her that they wanted to provide the world with the Bane experience. They start with his childhood, born into a political descent, and is sentenced to life in prison at birth. He then defeats the prison and goes into the world to fight the Batman. He and his people believe that this could be a major tourist destination for Americans fascinated with costumed villains, but too frightened to go to Gotham City. He and his investors would like to partner with someone who might help them convince others of the legitimacy of what they're looking to build. The woman looks back at him and tells him, I would like to meet these investors to massage any fears of my firm. Just then the woman's cell phone rings and she answers with a man asking, how do you have a phone? We searched you. The armed guards quickly open fire with her stating, thanks for blowing my cover. And Barbara asks, what is going on? Are those gunshots? The woman says that she is in Santa Prisca. Send her whatever it is and she'll try to dig something up. Also tell Batman that she's still not satisfied. She is still very, very angry. Soon the woman runs into a dead end and then yells that this was very stupid. He doesn't know why anyone would be so foolish to do something like this. The woman glares back. Yeah, you certainly don't. Your cash cow murdered my father and I won't be turning you into a horrid mascot for tourists in t-shirts. The man shouts, who do you think you are? And as a small gun springs out of her sleeve, she fires two shots, telling him, my name is Pennyworth, Julia Pennyworth. But back in France, Jim looks all over the table at all of the evidence against him, laughing to himself that he knows this game. He used to do it himself. The photographs are interesting though. Whatever was in the lab wasn't a Joker toxin, so what was it? Why did Joker come here in the first place? At that moment, the door opens and the woman from before walks in stating that she was sorry for keeping him waiting. Jim tells her, you've been on the other side of the glass for a better part of an hour. I know the trick. You put all this stuff in front of me thinking that I'd crack. However, at this point, you've checked into who I was and you don't actually think I did it. So tell me about this. What are my fingerprints on? She pauses and then tells him, a knife. One that eviscerated three scientists, the injuries matching up to a number of Joker attacks, according to the case files. What is so strange about this lab? There's something there you haven't said. The woman lights a cigarette, asking if he's ever heard of the organization called The Network. Jim says once in passing. All he knows is that it's where the villains sometimes get free vacations paid for by a cabal of villains that keeps itself hidden from the superheroes and that the Joker has taken them up on a number of occasions. Now what did they do in this lab? 
She tells them that they cloned human tissue illegally. She believes that it's a service offered by the network. And if they can replicate dental molds in human tissue, they can fool law enforcement into believing someone is dead when they're not. So what does the Joker want with cloned human tissue? She tells him that's the question she's been asking herself. And then she invites him to a drink as she introduces herself as Isabella Hollows. Meanwhile, back at the clock tower, Barbara continues to monitor Cursita with Spoiler coming in to check in on things. Barbara tells Spoiler to go get some rest. This person hasn't been very interesting in the past few days. But Spoiler is the one that notices something odd. She asks, why is Cressida dressed up? You don't get fancied up for nothing, and why is she staring at the camera? At that moment, an Italian assassin lunges at them. Barbara runs for her costume, but the assassin destroyed most of her gear. She throws a battering into his neck, and as he leans back forward, he tells them, ah, Beware the court of thee! He leaps at them again, but before he could finish, Cassandra jumps down, hitting him. No, beware of us! The assassin jumps at them again, and Cassandra defends, countering his attacks, hitting him with every opening that she gets. Eventually, he stumbles, going out the window. Barbara says that that was weird. He felt pain, didn't he? Cassandra, you can read body language. He did, didn't he? She informs him that he did, and Barbara says that that's even more interesting because Talons shouldn't feel any pain. There's something strange about all of this. Looking back at the monitors, though, they all realize that Cressida has flown the coop. This was all a distraction. Back over in Paris, Jim is sitting at a bar with the detective, Isabella. They begin to go over how Jim acts like Gotham is special, that there's great evil and villains over there. Jim informs her that with all the costumed vigilantes, of course it's different, but she tells them just because they don't wear costumes doesn't mean they don't have problems elsewhere. But as they begin to work out how they could be working together, the female Bane is towering over Isabella. It all happens so fast. Detective Isabella hardly had enough time to pull out her gun before this female-looking Bane, Vengeance, grabbed her hand, crushing it, letting the cracking sound ring out. Jim attempted to stop her, but she shrugged him off, with Vengeance pulling at Isabella's arm until there was a bloody splitch as her arm was torn off of her body. As Vengeance looks back, covered in blood, she tells Jim, I told you to go home. That is no longer an option. Later, Jim wakes up in the back of a car, bound by tape, and he begins to hear shouting. He sits up to see the French police surrounding them and Vengeance standing there until she turns back, ripping the car door off of the hinges and charges in. Using the door as a shield as well as a weapon, she bashes into the officer, taking his gun, using it to dispatch the other officers on the ground. When clear, she turns back, taking the metal door, throwing it into the air, hitting the propellers of the helicopter that's following her and sending it to the ground. With a fiery blaze behind her, Vengeance walks forward, grabbing Jim, continuing on to their destination. She tosses him onto the boat and begins to drive away when Jim finally manages to remove the tape from his mouth, asking if Isabella is alive. What did you do? Interpol wasn't even on to you. What do you even want? She looks at him. I am Vengeance. And Jim asks, who does she work for? Whose vengeance is she? Vengeance pauses for a moment to steer and then looks back. That is what I'm trying to decide. I visited a laboratory in Paris looking for the Joker, but the soldiers with me. They seemed to have their own mission to destroy everything. There was a part of the lab that the authorities didn't get to, and inside of it was something strange. DNA samples of the most notable costumed heroes and villains, and the sample for Batman had been taken. But then there was more. A file left behind by the Joker. The file read Bane Mark II Vengeance. It seemed the Bane Project had gone all too well. He hated his enemies so much that he never realized that hate was planted there. He was too clever, too charismatic, and he could not be controlled. But the leaders of Santa Prisca valued the symbol of Bane and what he represented to their island, the way other nations feared them. So they made a deal with the men in the laboratory to build a new Bane, one that they believed they would be able to control, one addicted to venom from birth. I was never meant to question who I am or why I did what I do. I was never given a story of my own. I was taken out of a tube and fully formed with hatred planted in my mind. And I would unleash this hatred against my target. Vengeance then leans down, tearing the tape off, and Jim says, That's a lot. That would make sense why your superiors wanted to destroy the building, but what did you do? 
She says that she did what she had to and stopped the soldiers. Jim asks, what is she planning to do with him? Obviously not kill him or he would be dead. So what does she want with him? Vengeance tells him that she wants his passion. He's an old man. He lived a long life and he has done good in this world or at least tried to do good. And like her, he's here to hunt the Joker. Her hate is what gives her strength. It gives her creativity. It gives her purpose. But she did not come about it honestly. She does not want to kill the clown for the generals who made her. She does not want to be put back into a tube and made into a weapon. She does not want to be their vengeance. She wants to be his vengeance. She wants to know why he hates the Joker. To be told why a good man has come to the other side of the world to stalk him and kill him. There was doubt in his face back in Belize. He knows he can't pull the trigger, no matter how much he wanted to. So she will kill the Joker for him, and she will be free to determine her own path. Jim says that they don't even know where the Joker is, which is what he was trying to get out of Interpol before Vengeance interrupted. Vengeance tells him that she knows where he is. The chief scientist who made her. He had a private estate on the island of Major Cor, a private laboratory. He was not among the dead, so the clown must have taken him to achieve whatever it is that he is looking for, and we will find him there, and death will find him. So the next morning, Vengeance takes Jim to Majakor, and during their drive, Jim explains everything. How the Joker shot Barbara, how he tried to make Jim insane, how he tried to make his second wife choose death. Jim tells her about all of the times that the Joker messed with his life and the tragedy that came out of each of those. Jim watches as the anger builds up in Vengeance, and he thinks to himself that he is currently loading a gun with a trigger that he doesn't have to pull. He should be calling Barbara and telling them, but that would also mean saving the Joker's life. So he's going to sit here, sinking deeper and deeper into darkness, knowing with more and more uncertainty that he may never see the light again. As the two pull up, they already see the massacre and the smell of blood filling the air. Vengeance grabs one of the dead guard's guns and hands it to Jim, and then begins to walk into the manor. It is more of the same. Bodies scattered everywhere, and sitting in the dining room is the Joker and a man. Jimbo, you made it! Vengeance screams as she begins to sprint towards the Joker, and the man says, Orchard Hammer Obsidian. Vengeance suddenly stops falling over. That's going to give us five minutes or less, and it will not work again. Also, I should note, Joker has rigged my entire house to explode. <laughs> I thought that it would liven up the place! I too have a bomb. One that will be able to kill the clown should I go through with my plot. So this is the time that you should leave, Mr. Gordon. The conversation that we are having does not concern you, your friends in Gotham City, or your new friend in Interpol. But rather than leaving, Jim sits down. Are you a member of the network? My name is Dr. Frederick Baum, and I am a member of the network. Though to call it that is just a silly fantasy of the police and intelligence agencies. We are independent players who work together to avoid the attention of the authorities and the costumed heroes and villains of the world. Perhaps I should show you the laboratory and answer some of the clown's questions. So Bomb leads Jim and the Joker down to the laboratory, stating that their goal was to grow body doubles for members of the criminal underworld. If a man was sent to prison for life, he could create a functional duplicate, then pay off some of the guards, swap the bodies, and their client would be given a new face and identity and be sent back into the world. There was also another use for his work that he didn't expect, though it was quite interesting. There are a number of powerful individuals in the world who have grown quite fond of the taste of human meat. There are even some secret menus at a few high-end Michelin star restaurants in the world, supplied by his laboratory. Jim raises his gun. Why are you telling me all of this? Bomb laughs. I will never see any consequence for my actions. The network will never allow me to come to light. So I can afford to not be shy. Joker bursts out laughing. <laughs> this guy! He's talking around the whole reason why I'm here! I don't like being made a joke of! Bomb continues to the next part of the lab. The chemicals that stained the Joker's skin damaged his genetic material. It means that creating any kind of double of him is a fool's errand. There were attempts, but they are gruesome. 
Jim looks over at a row of chambers with all of the genetic attempts at recreating the Joker. All of them deformed or disfigured. God help me. He snaps out of it, lifting his gun, shouting, You are trying to make more Jokers? <laughs> I was thinking of creating an improv team. Do a traveling show. Maybe even start a podcast. Ah, who am I kidding? That's all a joke. I didn't do this. I didn't want this. They did. Jim looks back at Bob. Why would you do this? Because I was paid a significant amount of money to do it. Who would want another one of the Joker? But as Baum begins to taunt him, a knife is thrown across the room, finding its mark in his throat. He falls to the ground, and a woman steps out. Uncle Sawyer's already said the lab meat tasted a bit off. You can't taste the fear of death in it. Or maybe we're just too old-fashioned here down in Texas. Joker begins to slink into the shadows, but he's quickly grabbed as a woman says, Buddy here would sure love to dig his fingers into that throat. But lucky for him, we respect our elders, and Uncle Sawyer wants to slow cook you. She injects the Joker with something to knock him out, and then Buddy groans, pointing at Jim. And the other woman says, Right, the cop. Before Jim could even react, a knife is thrown into his chest. He falls to the ground, watching the Samsons leave, and after nearly passing out, he hears a thundering voice shouting, Where is he? Where did he go? Jim mutters out to vengeance, Texas. She sets Jim back down, telling him, I am sorry. I had hoped this would go differently, but you can die knowing. You will have your vengeance. He begins to cough as he's left alone, reaching into his pockets. He pulls out the phone that Barbara gave him, and he struggles to dial her. Barbara answers, Hey, I'm glad you called. I just ran a blood test, and things are bigger than we imagined. And I don't even know what's at the heart of all of it. We just recently got attacked by a brand new Talon, and after doing some scans, the DNA is showing up for a match for James Gordon Jr. Your son, my brother. That can't be right. Right? Dad? Are you there? Can you hear me? But the phone has hit the ground as the blood is pooling around James Gordon. Days pass. Jim Gordon is laying in his bed after his brush with death, everything beginning to play back in his mind even as he tries to block it out. He can hear the laughter of the Joker. He can see the island, the lab, and vengeance. He can remember her anger, her promise to kill the Joker, and the killers who carried the Joker away. The pain subsides as he begins to move, because he needs to move. There isn't any time left. He shoots up out of bed, finding himself in a familiar place, back home in Gotham. He asks how, as Barbara walks in, sitting down telling him that she has a few friends in high places, but he's still lucky to be alive. I am not giving up on this, Barbara. We have to get to Texas. The Samsons have the Joker, and vengeance is heading straight for them. They're going to try to cook the Joker, and vengeance is going to cause a bloodbath. Barbara tells him that she has it covered. Put it as far out of his mind as possible. It's all done. She goes on explaining that these people have targeted their family, and it only feels right that their family sees it through. She'll tell Batman when it's all resolved. But as she speaks, Jim notices something and tells her, that there's something she isn't telling him. She brushes it off. You nearly died, Dad. That's what changed. Once I contact Cressida, I'll let her know that you're down for the count, and I'll be the one picking up things from here. I'll let them take me to Texas. Jim tells her he doesn't like it. And Julia says that she'll be tailing them from a private plane, and if anything goes wrong, she'll be able to extract Barbara in time. So the next morning, Barbara goes to meet Jim's benefactor at the airport. But while he's still recovering, he goes back to trying to piece everything together. Joker claimed that he wasn't the one behind A-Day, and that all of this is too deliberate to have not had a driving hand. Somebody wanted to draw vengeance out of the shadows of the network. Somebody wanted to aggravate a family of serial killers who cannibalize people, and they wanted them to overplay their hands. Somebody wanted him to bear witness to all of this insanity, knowing his ties to Gotham. Who benefits from all of this? Jim asks himself. And after a few quiet moments, it hits him. He knows who's behind everything. He grabs his phone, calling up Harvey, telling him that he needs to meet him. Look up a private airfield and get to it. He's coming to pick him up. Harvey asks where they're going, and Jim says right into the hearts of the horror show. Something that has been staring him right in the face from the start, and he thinks he just started to look it back in the eye. 
Before leaving, he stops by a tailor who's able to weave body armor into his clothing without bulking up. He also uses Cressida's credit card for that. Next is to pick up some surveillance tech, also put it on her card. And finally, one private jet and pilot to stay on call, also on Cressida's card. And over in Hooper County, the real Joker finds himself in a bit of predicament. A helicopter touches down at a grassy field, and the Joker is dragged out by the Sampsons and brought into a lone house. Sawyer Sampson steps out, pulling the bag off of the Joker's head. And I thought everything was bigger in Texas, but you're just a little old man, aren't ya? Sawyer slashes across the Joker's face. Silence. As he licks the blade, Sawyer tells him that he didn't come here to listen to his nonsense. He came here for the first taste. But while Jim sets his plan into motion, Barbara is standing in Jim's place for now, looking out the window of the plane, stating that it's really beautiful. Cressida asks, really? I always found this part of the country unbearable. Fields of brown nothing, though perhaps I'm just spoiled. Barbara says that she guesses, but Cressida tells her that she can pretend better than that. She's been doing well the whole flight. Barbara looks at her inquisitively. What do you mean? Cressida tells her, you're a smart woman. You should hide your contempt better. Did you like watching me all of those days from your silly little clock tower? Did it make you feel powerful? It's kind of thrilling to have someone's eyes watching me in those intimate moments. Barbara reaches for her watch, but Cressida asks, Oh, are you hitting the panic button? Your friend's plane is directly behind us now. My associate took control minutes after she took off. She's alive, for now. Barbara looks at her. Why does the Court of the Owls want Joker dead? Cressida says, because she told them to. Barbara stands up. Why did you take my brother? But Cressida's bodyguard grabs her, and Cressida laughs. You should have stayed far, far away from this. Barbara is knocked out, and Cressida asks if he's ready. And the bodyguard tells her, yes, I am. Meanwhile, over on Jim's plane, he lays out everything to Harvey about his run-ins with the Joker, the island, the lab, vengeance, and Harvey sits back in the chair asking, Why are you roped into all of this? Please say you have a plan, Jim. Jim says that he does, and Harvey asks, What? An old man is going to walk into a compound of billionaire serial killers to save the life of an evil clown? And Jim looks at him, something like that. <laughs> you can come up with a better plan than that. When you were commissioner, I never really thought that we were going to die. But Jim looks back. You can come out now. And Harvey's confused. Who are you talking to? Jim explains that the person in the shadows was left by Barbara to keep an eye on him. And he knows that they're listening. He's going to need their help right now or none of them are going to survive when they land. Orphan steps out from behind the shadows in the plane. Okay. Jim asks her if there's anyone else. You didn't bring the purple one. Orphan tells him, no, just me. Harvey stands up asking, What is she gonna do? She's a quarter of my size! There's no way that she can! But Orphan grabs him by the shoulder, spinning him around, slamming him to the ground. Good. When did you lose contact with Julia? Jim asks, and Orphan tells him, Three hours ago. Jim then takes out his phone, telling Cressida that he believes that he has her daughter and friend in custody. He's going to be landing at an airfield just outside of Hooper County in one hour. It's time they all met up together. Cressida tells him that she is sorry, but his daughter should have stayed out of this. They no longer require his services. Oh, I think you'll find that you do, Jim tells her. I know who's behind everything and who was behind A-Day. Tell him that I know why he's done all of this, but I don't know what he's after. Cressida pauses and then responds. One hour. Jim lands on the airfield where Cressida has Barbara and Julia tied up. She looks back at her bodyguard asking if he's certain about all of this, and the man tells her to be quiet. As Jim steps out, he lights his pipe, stating that this is how it's going to go down. Harvey's going to take my daughter and her friend and fly them back to Gotham. Cressida tells him that he's overplaying his aunt. But Jim takes a puff of his pipe and points out, The end game that he wants is only going to come about if I know that my daughter is safe. If she's not, I'm willing to burn everything to the ground. Are you prepared to accept that? Cressida begins to speak, but the bodyguard whispers something into her ear, and she turns angry. Very well! My Talon will accompany them on the flight home to ensure they don't get involved. Harvey steps out of the plane, asking if he's sure about this, and Jim assures him. As the plane takes off, everyone sits around as Orphan sneaks out of the shadows, taking the Talon out. Back on the runway, Cressida says that he has what he wanted. The game board is cleared. Jim looks past her, stating that he will address him directly now. I never did believe that you were actually dead. 
And even with vengeance running around, it only just hit me when I took a step back and I looked at all the pieces. This was never a Joker plan. This was a Bane plan. Bane, who's been posing as the bodyguard, pulls away the scarf covering his face and pulls down his mask. Very good, Commissioner Gordon. Then I trust you understand what's going to happen next. Meanwhile, over in Hooper County, the Samson's chef, Cookie, sits at the grinding wheel sharpening his knife as dozens of bodies are around him. But in the cage in the back, Joker looks up watching with a gag in his mouth. There's a level of wealth that most people never attain. The level where things are just better. Your clothes will fit better, the fabric feels nicer, you'll be able to chisel away every physical imperfection one by one. You understand all of that, but that's not what gives way to the allure. There's something obscene about true wealth. You see it when you walk past the sort of restaurant where everyone is wearing clothing that costs more than you make in a year. And yet there are some people who reach that unattainable level of wealth who just hunger for more. As the Samson family dine on the finer things in life, Uncle Sawyer taps his glass, stating that he has a few words he'd like to say. Their wealth and connections have bought them many incredible things. Most of them are too young to remember the days before they had the freedom to hunt and eat the way their family is compelled to eat and hunt. But the eldest of them remember that their kingdom was built on sacrifice, a deal with the devil himself. His brother, Billy the Brute, spent a lifetime behind bars so that they can thrive and live. But some damned clown decided to tear it all down for kicks. And the bastards that we have been paying off have not done anything about it. So now the Samson family isn't going to play ball anymore. We're going back to the old ways, getting our hands dirty. Tonight, clown is on the menu. The Samsons all cheer in unison, and outside, Cookie mans the grill, with the Joker poking his head out of his cage, telling them, I really hope you know how to season a clown. <laughs> Maybe a little old bay is in order. Do you think I might turn red shiny like a crab? Cookie shovels more burning coals on and tosses it back at the Joker, who laughs. Damn, I should have just pissed off some Maryland cannibals instead. At that moment, there's a loud explosion. And a few minutes later, back inside, one of the guards whispers to Sawyer that a masked woman appears to have set some of the oil wells on fire. Guards were sent to engage, but none of them are responding. Sawyer grits his teeth, stating that the damned costume idiots are ruining our fun. Listen up. Looks like we have dinner and a show. Get yourself something sharp and get ready. We got company. As the Samsons all begin to step outside, Vengeance walks up to the house and Sawyer says, I don't know who the hell you are. Some plant by the network to clean up, no doubt. We have the scrawny little clown out back for our main course, but look at you. Just imagine how those legs are chow up on the grill. Buddy, why don't you show her what a Samson man is made of? Buddy growls as he begins to charge forward, but as he gets ready to swing his knife, Vengeance uppercuts his head clean off his shoulders. Everyone stares in sheer shock, and they all jump on Vengeance trying to take her out. But her fists make short work of most of the Samson family. Sawyer watches us. Hell with this! Ricky, get on your feet! We won't be having the whole family get slaughtered today. Vicky cries out, holding Buddy's head, asking what about him. And Sawyer tells her to bring the damn head if she wants. You can keep it on your mantle for all I care. We need to get into the safe room. Once we're locked up, I'll call the network and get this whole thing sorted. With no one else to challenge her, Vengeance walks around the house to see Cookie already laid out over the grill and the cage next to him open. Joker walks out from the other side, buttoning up a shirt. You know, I told Cookie that he was the better cook, but you know what they say? Better to show than tell. Here, you can have a taste too. Joker throws a plate of human flesh at Vengeance who smacks it away and Joker begins to sprint. Except Vengeance reaches out one arm, grabbing the collar of his shirt. She begins to punch. I was programmed to kill you. Programmed to hate you with every fiber of my body. And even though I have broken free of my programmers, I must kill you to be free. Joker begins to laugh. <laughs> you were made in a fat and turned into a weapon. So what? We got flying aliens and robots in the future running around these days. You're nothing special. She punches again, and the Joker goes on. You're just a knockoff! You know that if you kill me, they're not even gonna know that it was you! It'll be... Oh, isn't it wild that this random chick punched the Joker to death in Texas? <laughs> 
The Joker laughs through the punching as Vengeance raises her fist one final time. But someone grabs it. No. She looks back and Bane tells her, Hello, daughter. It's time that we spoke. Vengeance stares for a moment. You, you're dead! And Bane looks at her. No, daughter. I am alive. Vengeance rolls her shoulder to free herself. Why are you standing in my way? The clown needs to die! But before her fist could end the Joker's life, Bane grabs it, throwing her to the ground. I told you no! <laughs> oh, this is great! But I may have already ruined enough family reunions today. Joker turns to leave, but sees Jim pulling out a gun. You're not going anywhere. Vengeance yells at her father. I won't let you take this away from me! But Bane grabs her by the face with his massive hand. You have a child's understanding of strength. It makes you weak! He punches her down. Your fury makes you mindless. It blinds you to what you can do. Think, free your mind. I have no idea what is going on, but I am loving it! Jimbo, you wanna put some money on it? Let's see which pain makes it out of you alive! I've already made my bet. Oh, you have, huh? You made some kind of murky, horrible deal, didn't you? Something that you're never going to be able to live with! Ha! I told you, Jim! I told you that I was gonna win! Shut up and get a move on, Joker. Jim pushes Joker into the house. Joker tells him, You've gotten so serious! I love it! Jim asks for the location of the Sawyers, and Cressida tells him that they're in the safe room. And Joker puts it all together. <laughs> wow! Teaming up with Bane and the Court of the Owls! Is the Riddler here too? Two-Face? That weird old guy in a green cape? Condiment King! Jim takes his gun, bashing it into the Joker's skull. I told you to shut up! Joker begins to rub his head. Ow! But what is her deal? I understand everyone else, but why does this woman want to kill me? Cressida explains that she doesn't care about the Joker at all. She finds him distasteful, and that's about it. Years ago, her father was the Grand Master of the Court of the Owls. When he was overthrown, he tried to get that power back once and partnered up with Bane to do it. Bane failed. She spent years of her life in hiding, terrified of the Court of the Owls. The global network of criminal organizations protecting them, keeping them hidden. She dreamed of tearing that network down, but she knew that she couldn't do it alone. She needed to force someone's hand to act. While her father had a run of the court, he paid close attention to the network's new cloning projects. He thought it might be a valuable resource for creating new talents. But the generals of Santa Prisca, they bit higher. They wanted it more. They tried to control Bane through mental conditioning, but he was too strong for them. And now they wanted him dead, and a new Bane to control. Thus, Project Vengeance was born. She had dangerous secret information about how the world worked, but she needed a plan to draw them out of the shadows. She knew who had the mind to concoct such a plan. But Bane's plan needed a scapegoat, and he had a grudge that he was nursing, one that would let her get the Court of the Owls to buy in. Joker was the perfect chaos agent, the one who would bring all of the sins of the network to the surface. She wants the court to fall. She wants the network to fall, and Bane wants his blood out of his captor's hands. Joker looks over his shoulder. Okay, what about you, Jimbo? What do you want? Jim tells him that it's taken him a while to figure that out, but if he's honest, it all keeps coming back to a night in an old cop bar in Chicago. One of his old buddies told him that if he were ever in a situation with a truly evil man, that he should not think twice. That when he saw evil, he should aim for the head. And that is where we're going to leave that for a moment. Because it's time to pass forward into the future. Because what happened at the end of this? How did it all resolve? Well, that's a question that even Batman has. Because later, as he got home to Gotham, Jim opens the door to his apartment. He doesn't bother with the lights, but instead grabs a bottle of whiskey and two glasses and has a seat at the table. He pours both glasses and says, You can come out now. You don't need to play it that way. Just come out and we can have a conversation. Batman steps out of the shadows. No, this isn't a conversation. I need you to answer one thing and one thing only. Where is the Joker? What did you do, Jim? Jim doesn't answer and Batman asks again. Where is the Joker? And Jim tells him, I, I don't know. Did you kill him? Instead of answering the question, Jim looks at him. You know, 
back at the beginning of this case. That is exactly what I was hired to do. I didn't say anything about it because I wasn't sure I was going to go through with it. And I wasn't sure I wanted you to stop me. I really considered it too. Had the opportunity several times, directly and indirectly. What happened in Texas, Jim? Jim looks at him. Do you know the criminal organization, The Network? I've heard rumors. Brushed up against the edges of my own work. Jim tells him. Today their organization is about to start to fall apart in their own hands. Batman glares. What did you do? Jim picks up his glass. I'm going to tell you a story. It's a long and strange one, but I'll try to sum it up. The important parts that you need to know about are... In Majakora, there was a man who worked for the network. A real mad scientist, Batman. A cloner. He was trying to create a new generation of costumed villains that this organization could control to keep prying eyes away from what they did in the network. The network also spent decades luring the most dangerous criminals to these little resort spas where they could stay off the radar of heroes and authorities. They also collected DNA from the villains, which was how vengeance was created. However, I wouldn't have found out about any of this without a young woman named Cressida Clark. She's the one who sought to expose the network. She wanted to tear down the organization that had cast out her father and destroyed her life. Through her father, she knew of the existence of vengeance. And with that, she allied herself with Bane. Together, they devised a plan that threatened to lay out the larger shape of the network for the authorities. They needed a scapegoat, though, to allow them to act freely, so they framed the Joker, who they knew was using the network resorts since the events of the Joker War. They then came to me, needing someone that they thought could piece together the larger mystery and drag the network into the spotlight. I was given money to deliver the Joker's head on a planner, but as I started to get involved, I saw that there was so much more to this. In Belize, the Joker was angry about something. He was also being used by the network and that a target had been placed on his head. But before Jim could continue, he looks at his empty glass. Hey, how about we go to the roof? I always felt like I was a bit more honest up there, Batman. Batman nods. Lead the way. As they go out, Jim lights his pipe and continues the story. You see, at some point, the Joker had figured out the network had taken his DNA and that they were going to use it. They were going to create jokers that they could control and weaponize. So he burned down the lab that I found in Paris, and went after the man behind the program and Mejikora. He was going to bring the whole system down. Everything was going according to plan until the Samsons arrived. A cannibalistic family that was rich and living in Texas. They weren't a part of the plan. Suddenly Babs was caught in the middle of this whole thing. What she found was another piece of the puzzle. There was a talon that had been chasing them. And that person... Anyway, back in Texas, Cressida managed to crack the code to the safe room, but no sooner than she did, Vengeance came to try to get the Joker after fighting with Bane. The problem with entering a safe room in Texas is that normally it's lined with guns. Guns the Joker seemed to have gotten a hold of. Vengeance tried to get in, but there was some muffled talking and the pounding on the vault door eventually stopped. I think Bane had a hand in getting her out of there. After tying up Sawyer and Vicky, Joker pointed his gun stating that he had to kill somebody. But who? Now the Samsons had already lost everything. Joker felt it would be more fun to watch them on the news. But I knew one thing already. If the Joker was going to kill me, he would have done it a long time ago. I called him out on that bluff, and I was right. So he shot Cressida. Joker left, and Cressida asked me to bring it all down. That was her dying wish. So I promised her that I would. Afterwards, Sawyer and what was left of the Samsons got rounded up. Bane and Vengeance most likely took their fight to Santa Prisca. And Joker, well... Joker's Joker. He's back in the wild. For so long, the Joker has been my devil. So long that I may have lost sight of all the other devils out there. I picked my shot and I took it. And it meant letting the Joker live another day. I'm pretty sure I'm going to regret that. But I can live with my choice. Just make sure to not let that damn clown stay free for too long, Batman. Batman looks at Jim. I won't. And Jim tells him thank you. After that, Jim made his way down, letting his mind drift to the Joker. He wonders where he is out there. But as his mind drifts further off to other things, which is probably healthier, Jim slept soundly because he doesn't hear that laughter anymore. He no longer dreams of the Joker. And there you have it, the full story for the recent storyline Joker. Now, I come on, we all knew the Joker wasn't going to die in the end. He can't die. But I do think this is some great actual character development for James Gordon. I'm hoping he gets reflected better now that he's apparently going to be working off on his own. And I'm not sure if this kept because I haven't seen James Gordon in the mainline Batman book yet. So 
Maybe this did keep. I don't know. We'll find out. But if you want more of these, check back every Monday to the Comic Story and channel to get more full stories. And if there happens to be some that you think you may have missed, we've actually launched a Comic Story and Full Story channel that only gets full story re-uploads. A lot of them are the other ones that didn't get recommended, so maybe there's one there that you have missed out on. Check that link down below. And if you want to continue to support us, please consider going to our YouTube memberships and to our Patreon. Thank you guys. I'll see you next time.